Psalm 67 says, Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. And we're going to do that together with the words of hymn number 31, beginning with verse 4. All creatures of our God and King. Oh, 
us so that we might live in Him and find eternal life. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Pat, for helping us worship the Lord today. I got thinking, if the Beatitudes were written today in Canada, what would the Beatitudes sound like? This is what I came up with. Number one, blessed are those who have powerful friends in high places. Right? That's how we think. How lucky you are to know someone who's connected. Number two. Blessed are those who get a corner office, two months paid vacation, and group benefits. Yeah? Number three. Blessed are the ones who are in good health, own their own home, and have a happy marriage. I mean, does life get any better than that? Number four, blessed are those who can afford a tropical vacation, or a cottage, or at least an RV. Number five, blessed are the beautiful, the rich, and the popular, with their big cars and even bigger mansions. It isn't that how Canadians think? Number six. Blessed are those who win, who are successful, who beat their competition, as well as their enemies. Yeah, those are the people we cheer for. Those are the speakers we want to hear at a conference. The successful ones. Number seven. Blessed is the nation whose military is well-trained, well-equipped, and backed up with nuclear weapons. And number eight, blessed is the nation that has a democratic government, a good health care system, and a high standard of living. Amen? We are a blessed people. And we are willing to fight to protect those blessings. We are willing to lay down the lives of our young people to protect protect those good things, those blessings that we have. If we Canadians are going to envy someone, it's those I just described. They're the lucky ones. They're the blessed ones. It, basically, I've described the, the American dream in a nutshell. And isn't that what most Canadians long for? Wouldn't most of us in Canada today prefer the American dream over the life that Jesus lived when he was on earth? So simple. So humble. So very little of this world's goods or privileges. I know one thing. We Canadians... If anyone messes with our high standard of living or our right to group benefits, we will scream bloody murder. We'll take up arms against anyone who threatens our privileges. I remember a few years back when the North America free trade deal was first signed. I guess that's a few more than, more than a few years now, isn't it? I remember how the, the good paying manufacturing jobs started moving to Mexico. And I, for one, applauded it. I saw Mexican people who had been living in poverty for way too long finally getting a chance at good paying jobs with benefits like we have enjoyed for so long here in Canada. I saw the Mexican people having the opportunity for a rising standard of living. And I thought it was great, sharing the wealth. But I 
dared not to express that among my friends and colleagues. For they were furious that Canadians were losing some of our privilege, some of our wealth, that we were risking a slightly lower standard of living. Are we willing to go to war to keep what we think is our birthright? When the American dream starts slipping away from us, we get scared. So I got thinking this week, how do our 21st century Beatitudes compared to the Bible's Beatitudes. Are we coming even close in Canada to living what Jesus laid out for us in the Sermon on the Mount? Are we getting any of it right? Would Jesus be proud of us in Canada today? Can the teachings of Jesus and the American dream be reconciled? Or has the church in Canada adopted the American dream in place of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let's take a look. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. So who is his audience for the Sermon on the Mount? It's not the huge crowd. He left them behind. This is very early in Jesus' ministry. He may not have even had all 12 of his disciples with him yet. Just a handful of his devoted followers are on the mountain with him. Why does he walk the mountain? To get away from the crowd. The last two verses of chapter 4 explaining this. And Jesus' fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and Jesus healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Huge crowds were seeking Jesus, but they were looking for miracles. They were looking for healing. They needed a doctor. So Jesus leaves the crowd, walks up the mountain, and sits down with his most devoted followers. Verse 2. And Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Where do we see this poor in spirit attitude today in Canada? Among the rich and powerful? I don't think so. Poor in spirit is seen most often among the disadvantaged, the underdogs, those who are often overlooked by society, those who know how needy they are but feel undeserving. We see it among those who are willing to accept the help of others because they know they are not sufficient in and of themselves. Where did Jesus find the poor in spirit in his day? I think he saw it in the woman at the well in John chapter 4, who'd been through five failed marriages. Now we don't know what happened to each of those marriages. Maybe one husband left when he found out she was pregnant yet again. Another one might have died of cancer. One may have fallen in love with her best friend or somebody from work and, and they took off together. Maybe she walked out on one of them because he was being abusive. We don't know what happened. But I can't think of any situation, any explanation where five failed marriages would be considered a blessing. Broken? Yes. Living in fear? Yes. 
Trust issues? Oh, yeah. But blessed? And then there's the, the widow who placed her last two cents in the offering plate in Luke 21. Would you call her blessed? She only had two cents left to rub together. It says in Luke 21, verse 1, And Jesus looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury of the temple. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites, or two cents. And Jesus said, This poor widow has cast in more than they all. For she had given to God all the money she had. She kept nothing for herself. Can you identify with this poor widow? Putting all you have into God's hands. I remember back in seminary. When Tammy and I had zero income. I really struggled with the idea of tithing. Because 10% of zero doesn't work. So I said, God, what am I supposed to do now? And I don't know if it was the right thing to do or not. But I made a vow to God. That if he would put something in my wallet, I would give something every Sunday at church. Sometimes a dollar. Sometimes a five. But I remember at least twice over those three years in seminary. There were at least two Sundays when I pulled out my wallet and all that was there was a $20 bill. Now you gotta realize, back in those days, in our circumstances, $20 was two weeks groceries. And I felt like I was in a corner. I was stuck between a rock and a hard place. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to see my wife go hungry, not have something to prepare for supper. I couldn't break my vow to God. He tested me. And he blessed. I gave in faith. And God just continued to provide. Over and over and over again. That this widow here. She was laying up more treasure in heaven than all the rich Pharisees and merchants and tax collectors all put together. Because she was giving sacrificially. She gave her all. And she was blessed. I think Jesus also found the core in spirit attitude in blind Bartimaeus. That poor beggar in Mark chapter 10, who was born without sight, sitting on the sidewalk, begging for coins from people he could not see, day after day after day after endless day, all his life. You call that a blessing? Jesus is leaving Jericho that day with his disciples and a very large crowd of followers. How many people in that huge crowd with Jesus that day? How many people received a miracle from God that day? As far as we know, just one. And it was not the rich or the powerful or the learned. It was the poor in spirit. Jesus sees the poor in spirit, and he has compassion. Bartimaeus got Jesus' attention by being poor in spirit, and he got his miracle. 
being able to see for the first time in his life. And the poor widow got Jesus' attention as she laid up treasure in heaven for a glorious eternity. And the woman of the well got Jesus' attention and she got a fresh start, a new beginning for her life. She also got the privilege of having Jesus in her home and in her neighborhood for the next few days, as well as having him in her heart and life forever. Blessed are the poor in spirit. If that woman at the well had tried to hide her past, deny her brokenness, she would have missed the blessing that Jesus had brought to give her. Beatitude number two. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourning means a loved one has died from cancer or coronavirus or, or from ethnic or religious persecution or, or from pr police brutality or, or in an accident. H how can that be a blessing? Well, we have to remember People like Jairus, who was shocked by the death of his young daughter. But then Jesus was right there with him when he got the news and was able to comfort him. The widow of Nain grieved over the loss of her only son, but Jesus came to comfort her. Mary and Martha sorrowed over the passing of Lazarus, but Jesus came to comfort them. The death of loved ones is a part of life. None of us can escape it. But not everyone has Jesus come to their house to support and comfort them in their grief. Those who do are greatly blessed. I don't have to tell you that. There's no one else I'd rather have during a season of sorrow than Jesus to comfort me. Beatitude number three. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. To be meek means to be humble, to have no voice, to be powerless. It's the opposite of being strong or rich or aggressive. Like the woman who anointed Jesus' feet. Now there's a picture of meekness. She had no right to be there. She won't even approach Jesus face to face. Matthew tells us about it. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was there, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them. And Jesus would turn to her and say, Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Another example of meekness would be the publican who was praying at the temple in Luke 18. Verse 9 says, And Jesus spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican or a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not as other men are. Verse 13. But the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, but he that humbleth himself shall be exalted by the Lord. The tax collector was the one who went home blessed because he did not think more highly of himself than he ought. 
because he was willing to admit his needs, because he knew he needed mercy from God. Because he was not full of himself, there was room in his heart and life for Jesus. Meekness opens the door to God's blessing. Beatitude number four. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus is not talking here about people who don't have enough to eat or drink. He's talking about people who are not satisfied with the status quo. They're hungry for more. Not more money, not more privileges or benefits, not more pleasures or perks, but for more of God. More of truth. More of love. More holiness than they have yet experienced in their own lives or in their church. A lot of people in Canada are hungry and thirsting for more. More booze, more drugs, more sex, more power, more thrills, more Facebook friends or Twitter followers. But so few seem to be to truly thirst for more of God. Who, who long for revival. Who crave more righteousness in their lives and in our community. So few who refuse to be satisfied until they experience deeper levels of God's grace and wonder-working power. There is a special blessing reserved for those who will not rest until their all is on the altar. Until their all is in God's hands. Until God blesses them anew. Remember Jacob wrestling with the angel in Genesis 32? And the angel said, let me go for the day breaketh. But Jacob said, I will not let thee go. Except thou bless me. The Lord rewards those who pursue him. Who long for, who yearn for, who crave more of God. Who are willing to stay on their knees until the Lord answers prayer. Who are willing to wrestle with God until they gain the assurance that their cry has been heard. And the answer is on the way. As the deer panteth for cool water, so my soul longeth after God. The attitude number five. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. There seems to be no place in Canadian business or politics or unionized labor for bleeding hearts, for, for compassion, for sympathy. It, it's seen as a weakness to be merciful. Because in Canadian society, the prize goes to the strong, to the aggressive, to the uncompromising. But it's different in God's kingdom, where grace and mercy are expected. Where compassion and forgiveness are commonplace. These are the things that get rewarded in the kingdom of God. Beatitude number six. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. To be pure in heart means to not have a hidden agenda. To have pure motives. To have integrity. As in, what you see is what you get. We're so used to hearing promises that no one intends to keep. We're so used to guarantees that nobody expects to be honored. It's easy to follow suit. But it's not to be so in God's family. It's different here. Blessed are the pure in heart. Number seven. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. God blesses those who would rather listen than make their point. Peacemakers are those who would rather compromise than win. Peacemakers are those who would rather walk away than fight. Rather cooperate than come out on top. Rather forgive than be proven right. There's little place in our culture today for peacemakers. But that's our calling. It's our mission. Our purpose. Number eight. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Jesus says. Sometimes we get feeling sorry for Christian leaders of the underground Chinese churches who go missing. Or we feel compassion towards Christian school children in Nigeria who have been kidnapped by terrorists. Or we feel awful about believers in Muslim countries who are arrested for their faith and their homes are burned to the ground. Or our hearts go out to followers of Jesus in communist nations who are imprisoned or buried in unmarked graves. But they consider it a blessing, an honor to suffer like Jesus, to suffer for Jesus. To suffer because of Jesus. We seem to have it all backwards here in the West. The things we Canadians celebrate are not treasured in the kingdom of God. And the things we back away from are values that true believers cherish and God loves. My point this morning is this. There is a very wide gap between Jesus' values and the world's values. When Paul tells us to, to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, he's not talking about social distancing from those who have different beliefs than we have. We still need to be friends with lost sinners and, and with neighbors of all nationalities. We still need to be friends with the poor, with our transgendered neighbors, with First Nation neighbors, no matter what they believe or what their lifestyle. Jesus befriended all kinds of people who looked at life so differently than he did. And he offered them an alternative. A different way to live, a different set of values, a different worldview. Being separate from the world is not about social distancing from people who think differently than we do, who have different lifestyles or different nationalities. It's about keeping ourselves from adopting the world's values. It's value distancing that Paul is talking about. The King James Version calls you and I a peculiar people in Exodus 19. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all peoples. See, God is trying to set his people apart, not physically, but in our attitude in our deeds and in our values. Again in Deuteronomy 14. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself, above all the nations that are upon the earth. And then in the New Testament, Paul says that Jesus, in Titus 2, Jesus who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, that's lawlessness, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous 
of good works. Peter says a similar thing. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Your homework this week is this. I want you to go home and practice being weird. Yeah, be, being out of step with the rest of the world. Being different. Being peculiar in our values, in our dreams, in, in, in our hopes, in our ways. Because God's ways are not Canada's ways. We have a whole new way of thinking when we choose to follow Christ. Our behavior is not supposed to make sense to other Canadians. Can we do that this week? Live differently than our neighbors, with different attitudes, different priorities, and surely a different destination. If your friends, if your unbelieving friends this week think you're a little Give thanks to God and praise His name. Because that means His grace is working in you. He is changing you according to His glory and grace, His truth and love. He is transforming you from the inside out. If your neighbors and friends think you're a little different, then the work of God's Spirit is showing. You're becoming peculiar. Congratulations! We are not the people we used to be. It's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. And His life in us sets us apart, makes us different. Viva la difference. Let's allow him to continue his good work in us. Would you pray with me? Father, you know that when Jesus walked this earth, people didn't understand him. His ways, his ideas seem so foreign, so opposite to what was accepted in society and even in religious circles. And Father, you know, sometimes we feel so out of place in this world. But we pray that you would give us grace this day to continue to press on to walk in the light that you have given us and to allow you to continue to transform our minds, to change our hearts, to renew us, remake us in the image of Jesus Christ. And if that causes us to be out of step with our culture, Lord, give us grace. We will consider that a blessing. May our lives this week bring honor and glory to our Father above. And may the name of Jesus Christ be exalted. It's in his name we pray. Again, in the blue book, we're going to sing number 649. Jesus took my burden and left me with a song. Praise God.
for his wonderful love, his great salvation. Taking away the old me and making a new me, a new you. Hallelujah. 649, sing the first and last verse. Jesus' name.